Hello and welcome, my name is Sheepthief and today I'll be coming at you with an Age of Empires 3 multiplayer online ranked 1v1 YouTube video computer game tutorial for the Iroquois. Anyone who's been watching my channel has probably noticed that I've been spamming Iroquois a lot, so I want to make this tutorial while it's still fresh in my mind because I'm going to be switching up um, my sieves a little more from here on out. I've also been asked by a few people in the comments to make a tutorial, so here we go. Um, some initial disclaimers are that, first of all, I am currently like low 1100s in ELO. Uh, I'd say I fluctuate between 1k and 1200 ELO, which statistically I think is right about average. Um, so. I'm not a pro by any means and I'm also not some Iroquois expert. I know that there are some people who are. Uh, also, yeah, so I, I'd say I've played about between 50 and 75 games of Iroquois um, and I still fail all the time with them and lose all the time with them. So. But I actually think this might give some insight into how the sieve is played at this level and hopefully help some people who want to try them out. Second disclaimer is that... Um, what is my second disclaimer? Oh yeah, my game is like has... I've, I've tried recording this... Uh, I, was, I was trying to record this earlier and, and it crashed so this may be split into two parts, hopefully not. Hopefully I can get this all done in one sitting. Mm. Yeah, so the Iroquois. The Iroquois, first of all their name, there's this weird typo that they added in the game where they change, th there's like this bug where it doesn't have the name properly appear, it has this sort of nonsense word. And some of the new players have started calling him this, not knowing that uh, the Iroquois, how to pronounce their actual name. So the actual name of the civilization is the Iroquois. This is a typo, just ignore that. Um, and and correct anyone who, because it's a, it's a really serious problem, I don't know why they haven't fixed it yet, but anyone who calls them this, just correct them and let them know that it's called the Iroquois, just so you know, you spread the... Um, spread the word and make sure everybody's pronouncing it correctly. Number two, uh, yeah, some basic here, uh, some basic history about the Iroquois. The Iroquois are an American Indian civilization, an empire that ruled um, the region of what is now sort of upstate New York and New England, extending all the way over to the, mm, the eastern parts of the Great Lakes and up into Canada um, they were quite powerful in the 1600s and early 1700s, but in the end they sided with the British during the American Revolution, and when that war concluded, the colonial, the new American government was not very hospitable to them, and their power declined. Um, yeah, as an AOE 3 civilization, they are, I would say, not too strong, not too weak. They have some serious strengths and some serious weaknesses. I would say, in general, if I was to categorize or describe them, they have a very strong age 2 and early age 3, but start to taper off as the game drags on. Again, I am not uh, the Iroquois sensei by any means, so I'm willing to be wrong about that. Let me know if you have differing opinions about how they should be played. Please, please let me know. So, without further ado, let's begin. I've prepared a little custom scenario to showcase the Iroquois, uh, and I'm wondering if that's what's causing these crashes. Um, so if this happens again, 
well, just wish me good luck. Hopefully, hopefully this doesn't happen again. Also, just a, a brief overview of how this is going to go. This was my little introduction. What we're moving into now is a unit overview, which may seem simple to some of you, but I actually think for each unit I have little pieces of information, statistics, tips that may help even veteran players. So yeah, a unit overview. Next, some deck card building stuff, which will actually be pretty quick. Then, openings. Uh, so in other words, early build orders and stuff. And then finally, like matchup information. So uh, tips and thoughts on how to fight various against certain c civilizations. So, here we go. Wish me luck. Okay, so um, in a second all these units are going to get out of order. Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't want them to do that, but every time they do it. So, we'll begin by uh, just describing each of the units. So, we're going to go age by age, starting age 2 into age 3 and then age 4. So, age 2. First unit, the Aena. The Aena is a unusual unit in Age of Empires 3 because it only costs one kind of resource. It costs 100 food. It is trained from the War Hut. Uh, the... Yeah, so 100 food, quite cheap. Also quite... Um, I mean, you literally just need to have villagers on food and you have the resource to make it. Oh, no, the okay. problem with the Aena is primarily Hanyu its animation, so I'll just show Hanyu you right Hanyu here. If I come Hanyu up to this Hanyu bear Hanyu and right click Hanyu it, Hanyu as you can see there, it had this long, terrible animation where the, a where the soldier had to aim, sort of lean back, pull the bowstring, and then loose the arrow. Uh, this is different from a crossbow the standard foot archer, which just you right click and it shoots. You right click and it shoots. You right click and it shoots. If I try to do that with this, I cancel the animation. So I, I start the animation, I cancel it. I start the animation and I cancel it. So the Aena is really bad for like uh, micro. This means you have to fight with it differently. So how do you fight with the Aena? The Aena actually has does more damage than a crossbow. Um, and it's actually much faster than a crossbow. But its animation means that you can't fight with it like a crossbow. What you need to do is get a decent mass of them and then let go. Don't over micro them. Right click, er, attack move to the enemy and then just let go and let the Aena start firing. If you start over microing you're going to cancel their animations and you're going to get messed up. Now fortunately you have this really uh, high speed, this very very high speed by infantry standards. Like I don't, I can't think of any infantry that goes faster than that. Except like maybe Rodoleros and stuff. Maybe there are a few examples, but it's, it's unusual for infantry to be this fast. And you can actually kind of keep distance on. You can't out. You can't run away, but you can actually keep distance on cavalry coming in. Like you can back away from cavalry quite quick, quite quickly. So what you do is you get a mass of them, let them fire, and then if the enemy gets too close, like if their musketeers get within range, just back up a little bit, and then do it again. Um, but yeah, generally don't over micro is the lesson with them. Your next unit is... Oh yeah, before I forget, the uh, there are upcoming changes to the Aena, which are uh, important. They are not active yet as far as I know, but they're changing. Uh, they're making it so that the Aena locks onto its targets, so that if a... Let's say the bear came into range and then was like, uh-oh, an Aena and backed off. Or, better example, let's say this is an enemy tomahawk. He comes into range of my Aena and he says, oh, there's an Aena, I'm backing up. Now, that would cancel the animation. Backing up would cancel the animation, but in the upcoming change, it won't. And the Aena will lock on and still fire its arrow. So backing up won't, he'll still get hit. 
The other thing they're changing is something about damage based on how close you are to the Anna, and I have no idea how that's going to work, but it's going to change it and presumably make it better, so um, just be aware of that. Your next uh, H2 unit is the Tomahawk, which is essentially a musketeer, um, but is different for a few reasons. First of all, it's, I would say, in gen overall, a little worse than a musketeer. A musketeer normally does 23 ranged attack. The Tomahawk does four less than that, which is a lot less than that. Um, so their range attack is straight up worse. Add on top of that, like the AANI, they have an absolutely awful animation. Where a musketeer just instantly, bang, fires. Fires his musket. The, uh, the Tomahawk has to take a second. And the projectile like flies through the air. Oh my god. The battle of the terrible animations. Um, so, bad animation that does straight up less damage. The They cost like five fewer resources than a musketeer. Not that much. Not, not anything substantial there. Um, like all H2 Iroquois units, they only cost food and wood, which is sort of a blessing and a curse would be harder the, harder to gather than gold but you know it simplifies your early macro economic macro so um, yeah that's the that's the tomahawk where it's better than a musketeer is its melee anti cav attack it does one more damage than the musketeer's 13 but as you start to add bonuses to the tomahawk that starts to bloss, um, balloon and when you have them upgraded with some of the home city shipments and just normal upgrades, you get a anti-cav attack that's quite strong. There have been multiple times that players, again at my elo, have underestimated Tomahawk's anti-cav ability and just tried to like man fight them. Tomahawks are better than musketeers at that at, at anti-cav purposes. They don't look it because it's sort of like a shirtless dude with some ax hatchets, but. It, it, they are better at uh, anti-cav. So that's the tomahawk. Now, um, before I forget, the main thing about the tomahawk, the main reason you need it is it's your only decent access to siege in age 2. Uh, and a theme you will see throughout this whole tutorial is that siege is a huge problem for the Iroquois. So the more of these you have, the better. Just because you can, if you win a fight, you can actually win the game by burning down their buildings with these tomahawks. Uh, I would say my one piece of advice with them is don't just trade with musketeers with the tomahawks. Keep them alive and like a 10v10 tomahawks versus musketeers, the musketeers win. You need like two or three good volleys, free volleys on a mass of musketeers in order for it to start being worth it on your side. Also, charging in on melee isn't isn't good. Uh, I've tried it. It's not good. Um against musket against musketeers uh, so yeah keep them alive don't just take a man fight with musketeers your third a colonial age unit is the Kanya horseman trained from the stable costs uh, 175 resources uh, which is cheaper than its equivalent the hussar um, by 25 resources, which is substantial. Uh, the difference between them is the Hussar has substantially more hit points, 320, so that's um, 25 again, right? I think that's 25. My my, um, no, that's more than that. That's um, 35. 35 fewer hit points than a Hussar. No, yeah. 35. 35 fewer hit points than a Hussar. And, um... But, you get 10% uh, more range resist. So these are quite good at being meat shields in, like, skirmisher engagements. Um... And they get better and better at that with every upgrade you get. Because that 30% that range resist is good. And I think a lot of people are used to sort of microing down hussars with their skirmishers once they have a big enough blob. Like, you know, you back up with your skirmisher, snipe a hussar, back up, snipe a hussar, do a lot of damage to a hussar. It's harder to do that against Kanya, so 
be braver with your Kanya against skirmishers, but at the same time be more uh, cautious against melee anti anti cav musketeers, pikemen, anything like that will uh, be stronger against Kanya than a normal hussar, just because they have fewer hit points. Um, so yeah, be again. They're better against ranged infantry than a hussar, but worse against melee infantry. In a um, is that it? Let me think. Yeah. So the 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 main thing um, with the Kanye horsemen is you just need to sort of they, they will slow down your age three substantially. If you're making Kanye in age two, you are you are committed to age two. Um, so just start. Try to learn. If you're getting into the Iroquois, try to kind of read the game and figure out whether or not you need to stay in H2 and make Kanya, or whether or not it'd be better to go up to H3. Okay. So that's the Kanya horse. And that is th this. This is your age two. Um. Uh, arsenal right here: the Kanya, the Tomahawk, and the Anna. And with these three units, you can cause some serious pressure in H2. Um, but we'll talk about that more in sort of the card or the deck building um, part of the video. So uh, next we have H3 units. The first one is your skirmisher, the forest prowler. The forest prowler is, uh, in my opinion, one of the best skirmishers in the game just because they have this great animation. Um, they also look cool. Like, look at that guy. He looks cool. Um, and then their animation just bang. 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 Yeah, um, they, they're just strong skirmishers. They cost as much as a skirmisher. They can go stealth. I've never really used this stealth, but that just goes to show that I haven't fully mastered this civilization. Uh, and it just feels good to have a big mass of them. And yeah, that's that's the forest prowler. Um, supporting them for anti-cav in H3, you can have the musket rider, which is a little. Ch it's substantially cheaper than a dragoon. A dragoon costs 180 resources. This costs 155. That's 25 cheaper. Um, okay. You get five more hit points than a dragoon, but two less attack, which is huge. Uh, it's actually 10% less attack, and so you you if your your volleys with musket riders just feel worse than they do with dragoons. Um, musket riders, anything else to say about them? Yeah, the main thing that you need them for is uh, anti-artillery, so especially against e European civs that are going to send falconets. E uh, commonly, the first the first thing I get in it in my uh, in H3, the first card I send is five musket riders just to get that anti-artillery oh. mass. I'd say you need like between 10 and 15 to reliably take down a falconet. And just say this bear is a falconet, you have to get really close to them. Like that close. And then they have like an. I feel like their animation is worse than a dragoon, but that might just be in my head. I don't have anything to back that up. But it just feels worse, and it might just be that their damage is worse. So you need a lot of them. A lot of them die when you're trying to snipe falconets. It's It gets ugly with these, but you need them. Um, and then they also work like a, a dragoon as anti-cav, um, but I would say the main thing that I just like have to have them for is anti-artillery. So yeah, in age three, the bread and butter of your army are these two units, a skirm goon army composition, a tried and true, you know, um, army, but they, the issue with the Iroquois is you you can win these battles in the game with this great animation on the forest prowler these okay musket riders but you have you can't you can't drive home 
the point you can't finish the game because you have terrible, terrible, terrible siege. Uh, one, and so that brings us into the siege, but before I do that, one other thing is that musket riders, I know they used to be good at raiding enemy ecos, like you could get your musket riders into people's villagers, but now they've changed the way all ranged cavalry works against villagers, and it just feels bad. Like, I've, I've had 20 of these get on top of... 20 villagers on a hunt and like two or three of them die because they do so little damage to him at one point I literally put them on melee just to snare the villagers uh, it does not feel good raiding with musket riders or by that token any ranged cavalry anymore so they really just serve the purpose of anti-artillery and then anti-cav like like a dragoon um, but again the anti-artillery aspect is more emphasized for the Iroquois than it would be for other civilizations. So yeah, your siege. Uh, let's start with the ram. The ram is, um, I would say, your best siege unit. Um, you want to have these ready to. So so what is the ram? It doesn't have that many hit points. It has 50% range resistance, which is a lot. So it can absorb a lot of fire, but it just doesn't have a lot of raw hit points. It has a really good siege attack, 75 damage at every 1.5 seconds. So like four of these, there's a, there's a card that I have in every deck, four elite rams. Um, four of these can really start to melt buildings, but it's not like overpowered. If you get like 12 of them, you can really just start to, they start to demolish everything in their path. Um, four of them, you can take down buildings um, finally. It's pretty much your only way of doing it, but it's just not ideal. And then, and then the main issue is they can't do anything but attack buildings. And then they're not cheap either. They they cost 120 wood, which just hurts. It just hurts. I'll tell you from experience. If you're like, oh, I don't have any siege, I can win. I could win three fights in a row, but I wouldn't be able to like break through their town. And right now, the current meta is like heavy w building spam, heavy cancer, heavy just pure carcinogenic. Haciendas, forts, tower spam. Oh my god. You guys, if you guys watch my videos, you'll know how much I complain about this. Just cancer, cancer, cancer. You've got factories like soldado spamming out of haciendas. Um, some people are even walling. I think I already said forts everywhere. Like playing against the US, USA, they're like three forts somehow in the on their side of the map you need siege and the main the main weakness of the Iroquois is their lack of siege so you need these things um, but they they can't do anything but attack buildings and so it just hurts spending um, 200 resources per ram on something that's not going to do anything if it gets it if they get caught out they just die um, if hussars get on top of them they just melt if Musketeers, even even with their 50% range resist, if like a mass of musketeers can like micro these down, and they it's not like a falconet which is hurting the musketeers, it just sits there and dies. But it's your only way of dealing with it. The other one that you get in age three is the mantle. It it has more health, 50% range resistance, and what I was originally doing is grouping them together with the forest prowlers because they in a fight actually move forward because they have less range than the forest prowler. And in that situation, if you have like fewer forest prowlers and they have skirmishers, but you get some mantlets in the front, you're going to win the fight. It works kind of like a battering ram, and if any of you have played Age of Empires 2, you can put a battering ram in like a ranged fight, and it will absorb so much fire that you'll win the fight. It works identically to that. The problem is that grouping them together with the skirmishers, they go 0.5 speed slower oh, than the forest prowler and that just feels really bad and I it feels so bad that I don't do it I actually just don't really make mantelets if they increase them to four speed then I would make them all the time I would have them be in every even if they increase them to like 375 maybe but having your skirmishers go what would that be an eighth slower I guess uh, feels horrible. 
and is not acceptable. So I don't really use these that often. They're better than nothing. And I guess if I they cost wood and gold. If you're like low on food, you could do you could put some of them. I guess you could make them. They have an okay range attack. And then their siege is okay, but nowhere near as good as the elite ramp. Nowhere near. This, these are not a good anti-building unit. They're a good like skirm skirm battle winning unit. So that's the mantle. I would say they're the weakest unit on the roster. So then, um, yeah. So this is this is these are your age three units. Really, just ignore the mantle. These are your age three units. Then you get, if you're getting into age 4, I would say you've got a problem. In my opinion, the Iroquois are weak as time goes on. As, as it goes later and later, you get weaker and weaker. Um, but there is this moment when you get to age 4 where you get the light cannon, which works as sort of a combination of a falconet and a culverin. It has really high range, I think only less range than a culverin, or maybe a mortar or something. It has really high range. Um... It's not as good as a falconet against infantry, but it's so long range that you can like accomplish the same anti infantry pressure, but it doesn't have that same like literally infantry erasing ability as a, a big line of falconets. It's okay at sieging buildings just because of its range, but it, what it's really good at is taking out enemy cannons. Uh, it just works pretty much identically to a falconet. Uh, and then the other good thing about it is that it's always unlimbered and isn't super slow. And so you can actually micro really well with it, like bang, fire, and then move. It doesn't need to unlimber. Um, and I would say there's this, this brief window where if the enemy is in age 3 and you get up to age 4, you can win a cannon engagement with these light cannons and and finish the game right there uh but as time goes on heavy cannons are better than light cannons upgraded culverins are better than light cannons the other thing is you should you should upgrade them always upgrade them uh because upgrade them early and often um also you can kind of mass a fair amount of them they don't feel that bad to make and there's a card that you can send called Siege Construction, which reduces their population, um, and it, which makes it so, so that you can get a lot of them. And if you have a lot of upgraded ones, you can. It feels pretty good, but I would say space them out a fair amount and kind of like don't keep them all in one place. But one of my huge weaknesses in this game in general is cannon micro, so. Um, this this unit is the one that I'm the most hazy on and have used the least of all these, but they're they're good they're good. Uh, I would just say there's a window where they're really good and they can win you the game, and then they start to kind of like get outclassed by some other more niche cannons. So that's the unit overview, and this this is where I have like for some reason been crashing in this little scenario that I've set up here. So if I crash. I'm just going to turn this into a two-part series, but hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of the other stuff. So the first thing is... So I guess I, I guess I just want to one more time reiterate. When you're in age three and you have an army, have elite rams ready to go. Because elite rams are how you win the game. You need them in order to destroy their base. Uh, barring the person just losing their army and surrendering, which happens a fair amount. Um, if they are like, I'm not going to surrender, my base isn't being threatened, that's totally valid. Because if you don't have rams, there you have no threat to their base. The only other threat to their base is, the to is a mass of tomahawks. Um, so that's that if you don't like making rams, your your alternative is to have a big group of tomahawks. Uh, and then I would also say, if you have a ton of forest prowlers, they still have a siege attack. Like, they they can still do siege damage. They actually do well. Yeah. And it's actually not even that much. It's it's like it is way less than a tomahawk, but 
if you have a lot of these, they can still slowly take down buildings. So don't just be like, I can't destroy any building. Still try to destroy the buildings with your forest prowlers. Um, but yeah, so don't don't forget that. But it'll feel bad and what will not feel bad is having oh thank god I made those four elite or I sent those four elite rams or I made five elite rams I can pressure their base now and, and take some actual uh, take some actual ground so that's one of my huge tips for the civilization is have elite oh, no, rams okay. ready to go before a fight before you win a fight so I'm going to talk about some of the big buttons the so called big buttons the important big buttons and then um, we're going to talk about the the fire pit. So, um, first of all, uh, let's just go through. So I'll, I'll just talk about the big buttons. The f these two are not good. This increases your the speed of your um, siege units. Maybe in the late game it would be good for your light cannons because they're already kind of fast, and making them ten percent faster wouldn't even be that much. But Maybe that's okay, but no, this is not something that should ever really be used. Uh, this makes cavalry speed go up, which again, against a, if if there are a lot of like dragoon fights happening, um, I could see that being kind of useful. Maybe if you want to get well, your Kanye on top of something really quick, that could be useful. But again, not something I get all the time at all. Uh, it's too expensive. If it was a little cheaper, I'd say I'd say do it more often. Uh, and then the cavalry build time, eh, not not super useful in 1v1s. Again, maybe in certain types of games it would be better. What's almost always useful is lacrosse. Very expensive, 600 wood, 600 gold. But it adds two range to all of your infantry, which makes your oh, forest prowlers okay. have a really crazy range. It also gives them line of sight, which I'm really crazy about. Like, any line of sight is always good in my opinion. How Make sure Aenas have a really long range, and they already have an okay range. And then your tomahawks actually end up having the same range as a strelet. Um, so your tomahawks can start hitting from way far away, which makes them feel better. Uh, they can literally outrange musketeers, and I sort of wonder if that's why their range attack is so low. Um, so it actually makes you getting lacrosse makes your tomahawks in my, like a good range unit. Uh, and then it just makes your your other ranged units, which are already good, even better. So lacrosse is like, as the game goes on, worth sacrificing some unit production to get lacrosse, just for the sake of lacrosse. It's really good. The other big button that I use all the time is this. Each uh, age you get a, a improved version of the Iroquois st scouting party. You can see they they the typos there. They're not calling. They they have the the wrong name for the civ, civ there, but Iroquois scouting party. Uh, this is a good cheap way of massing up some tomahawks um, for for way cheaper than normal. Um, actually, not really. Maybe a little cheaper because wood takes longer to uh, gather. I sort of thought that was a good deal, but it what it does. We'll we'll talk about this in the openings, but um, it's a good way to mass to quickly mass up some tomahawks. Uh, so those are the big ones. There's some other ones that you can get from like the the farm and the plantation and like the market, which give you resource crates. I never use them. Maybe I should, but it's sort of like as time goes on, it gives you more resource crates. So just bear that in mind. But I just personally never use them. So those are the big buttons. Again, the the ones that I think you need to worry about are lacrosse, and then this one, which uh, the so the the town center big button and the war hut big button are the ones that I use. Um, and then okay, so now we've come to the forbidden jitsu, um, which is the cancer lame that you can use as the Iroquois. To preface this, I'll just give uh, some information on the war hut. The war hut is exactly like a tower or an outpost. Uh, it looks bigger and like it should be beefier, but it has exactly the same ta stats. It does the same amount of damage, same amount of health. Everything's completely the, completely the same as just a normal European tower. 
Uh, I guess the only difference is that it takes up a little more room. Uh, I would say actually another difference is it just looks like it has more health. So someone, like, you would assume by looking at this, yeah, that has more health than a tower. But it doesn't. But I think people, like, look at a war hut and they think that's going to take longer to siege. But that's incorrect. Um, so, that's the war hut. Um, which brings us into the forbidden jitsu. So, the forbidden jitsu... Sh oh, we're going to have to, like, age up. Well, we don't even have to. Um... So this is the fire pit. You have two unique um, powwow dances you can do. One spawns travois, and the other one increases your population. So the population one is for super late game. That's useful. But the travois is the forbidden jitsu, and it's really cancerous. And I'll show you. If you have 20, so what you do is you have 25 villagers, and you hotkey them. Um, so, seven. And they can be doing whatever, and then when you want to, you bring them to your powwow circle. And every 13 seconds, a trevois will spawn. So, how do you, what is the forbidden jitsu? So the first forbidden jitsu is just spamming war huts. You can, like get war huts all over the map and there's some cards that you can send that I'll talk about in the card building phase which make it so you can have like 20 war huts all over the map you can have total vision of the map you can upgrade them super cancerous um, and uh, yeah so just like it's free buildings the other m less cancerous thing that you should do is um, like uh when you're when you need to make plantations down here don't never use 600 wood to build a uh plantation just do this and get and you can make a plantation i can't build it right now because i'm in the first age but that's 600 free wood these plantations normally cost 600 wood there's a typo where they call it the estate now but the actual name for it is a plantation and um you can the same thing can be said for farms so how you set up the the forbidden jitsu is build like three farms around the f the forbidden jitsu powwow pit boom and boom and then when you need your villagers to well let's let the farms finish building so yeah, you can just spam stuff like you can take over all of the um, trading posts pretty quickly. Um, that's one thing I do when I'm when I'm doing this. Take over every single trading post. Weird. That's like bugged. Whatever. Um, every single native thing. Just like this is cancer. Uh, and again, with the war hut upgrades, you can like cover, you can protect your base in like this huge ring of them. Now, I'll say I, I've actually lost a lot of elo trying to like cancer spam like this. Um, it's just not my style of play, and I sort of hate myself while I'm doing it. But um, yeah, this is this is the forbidden jitsu. Um, and when you when you have enough, you just um, select your villager hotkey, and if you have these farms all around here, you can just right-click one, and they'll organize themselves and go to the other farms. Or at least normally they do. It takes them a second, but they all, like, figure it out and go to the farm. Yeah. And so then, yeah, okay, we're getting food. Oh, boy. Oh, no, I'm losing the game. I need to revert to cancer spam. What do I do? Select all of them. Back to the cancer pit. Warhead spam. Yeah. So that's the forbidden jitsu. Uh, other than that, the only other thing to talk about is that the explorer, and I didn't actually spawn an explorer, the explorer um, in an area of 24, a radius of 24, which is like, I think more, that's more than the forest prowler's range. So it's a huge range. 
increases all units hit points by 10% so you want your explorer with you in fights um, and I think he goes faster than a forest prowler so you can just put him in your forest prowlers and it'll be it'll be fine so that pretty much concludes the unit and building overview and we will move into the deck building stuff and thankfully I didn't crash let's hope that that remains so Am I forgetting anything? Let me check my notes. No. Yeah, just the uh, the uh, war chief. Remember that the war chief increases hit points. So quit. Yes. So let's go to deck building. Um, so I think there are deck building is actually quite straightforward with the Iroquois. Really in every game I think you have two choices. There, um, Do you think in the matchup that you're, you're going into are you going to be fighting heavily in H2 or do you think you're going to go up to H3? And it really only changes one card and it's um, this one. So new ways is one option and then conservative tactics is the other option. Conservative tactics is if you're staying in H2, which is easy, easy to remember because think like H2 conservative, like um, older units, archaic units, new ways, more progressive uh, going into um, H3. So like progressive H3, yeah, more more advanced. You know, like in H3, they don't have any weird backwards ideas about you know how how women shouldn't be in the army and like how you know gay people shouldn't get married and stuff that's like what weird backwards conservative uh people in age 2 think and so that's that's how you remember anyway uh new ways is actually really good and is generally the the more the better option um it gives you the arsenal or some of the arsenal upgrades that the Europeans get. The big ones are ranged cavalry caracal, which gives more range to your musket riders, which makes them feel so much better. Seriously, the ranged cavalry caracal is really good. Uh, the other one is counter infantry rifling, which makes your uh, Forest Prowlers, way, way, way better. It gives them an increased multiplier against infantry. And then Cavalry Cuirass makes your Kanya Riders um, tankier, but not, not by a ton. Um, the issue with New Ways is that if you're just in Age 2, New Ways isn't that useful. The only one that it's useful for is Cavalry Cuirass, which makes your Kanya Riders, I think, just 10% tankier, so not that much better. And then uh, Infantry Breastplate makes your Aenas um, a little tankier. So, but it's just by like 10%. It's not that good. Um, so if you're, if you're staying in age two, you wouldn't want new ways and instead you'd want conservative tactics, which just straight up gives your, uh, Aenas and Tomahawks plus 10 hit points plus 10 attack. Uh, so it's just like a safer, m more effective upgrade that upgrades more of your stuff. So age two, Conservative Tactics, H3, New Ways. Now, as for your H2 cards in general, I think that everything here you always need. And as you can see, it's identical in H2, uh, except for that card. You need the three, you need the villagers. One question is in H2, do you actually have this four villager card? Five villagers is a lot of free villagers. Always have this card. Re really, my point here is that each of these cards I always use it's always good. Uh, the gold you need to get up to H3, this is good for uh, extended H2 fighting these three, these uh, resource crates. The Aenas you need, the Tomahawks you need, the uh, these two upgrades for your Warhut units you need, and then the Kanya you need. You need all of these. I can't actually think of a time when you wouldn't need any of these. The ones that The one that I probably use the least is Cords of Wood, weirdly. But I think any deck for any sieve that doesn't have like a wood shipment in age two is a little questionable. So 
if you're going to if there's a card in here that you want I'm just trying to think what card in here you'd want that is better th than anything in there the only one that I can think of is some laming with your war chief and this actually gives you a lot of siege damage so I could see either switching out I could see switching out conservative tactics. I can't see switching out new ways. If you think you're going up to H3, you should have new ways in your deck. Um, but if you think you're going to stay in H2, I could see switching out cav or uh, conservative tactics for Town Destroyer. Maybe switching out the ANS, but 7 ANS is pretty strong. And then maybe switching out the wood, but that's, that's just questionable. Uh, but it, all these other cards, I don't think there's anything in here that you want. The only thing that you could do is if you want an anti-water deck you could send these um, buccaneers uh, and I took out the ANS uh, if they're on water yeah I guess having these buccaneers come go and destroy all their uh, fishing boats would be nice so I have an anti anti-water deck as well as for H3 again there's just not that much I, I, I don't I can't think of any thing to change here in H3. Maybe I'm being arrogant, but it's the way I actually just it would feel bad to take any of these cards out. Um, the resource crates are quite useful. You need these eight forest prowlers to get your skirm mass up and going. This gives your this this you absolutely need always in every deck. These musket riders are the most common thing I send in H3. These six Kanya horsemen are good for trying to get a Kanya mass up, but that could be one that I could see switching out if you want something else in here. Um, cavalry hit points and cavalry damage I think are essential. Um, we'll come back to this because this is the one that I think out of any of these that you could maybe get rid of. The four rams are essential. In every deck, you should have the four rams. You need them in order to close the deal on a game. And then I think these five cuirassiers, they've saved me so many times. Uh, there's a timing. If you're, if you, the, the earlier you send them, the better. As time goes on, it's only five of them, and they're they're not upgraded. So it needs to be early on, and they're not gonna. As time goes on, they become less and less useful. So if you do this do it sooner rather than later and don't rely on it there it saved my ass many times but it's also like I've I've been losing and just been like well I'll send the cuirassier and then just lost like it they aren't it's not overpowered but if it's at the right moment it can be it can be game changing um so I think the I think the cuirassier should be in every deck the ram should be in every deck the mantelets I have in here just because any siege you can get is good you could argue for Mohawk support, which sends six rams and five mantelets for a thousand gold, but a thousand gold, uh, it does not feel good stacking that up in H3. Um, I could also maybe see these Dutch, these these uh, halberdier have decent siege. Um, I don't know, but yeah, the mantelets. I could, if you don't like the mantelets, you could take them out um, and switch them out for something in here but yeah these are my decks um so and then the only other deck i have is the forbidden jitsu deck which is basically just um spamming war huts so you can get uh twice as many war huts with extensive fortifications um the sooner you're getting the them out the better uh, so I actually have both villager shipments, so I can get to that 25 villager number in order to start sp doing the forbidden jitsu. Um, so yeah, it's just like it's it's just straightforward cancer, extensive fortifications, extensive fortifications. I feel like there's something else too. Yeah, then in age four, heavy fortifications, which upgrades all of them. Um, which is is good like it yeah and then improved buildings improves their hit points so this is pure cancer and, and it really does slow down the game when you have 20 war huts around your base like it's hard to push into that so it, it does commonly go to age four uh these dragoons are pretty good i think and 
also I have native warrior combat uh, because you can you can get all of the natives and then make embassies for free with the forbidden jitsu and um, then you have the natives um, yeah uh, I was sort of wondering about with the forbidden jitsu ha sending this warhouse thing it's it gives each of your houses 10 attack I just don't think that's not I don't think it's that good maybe maybe it's good if if they're walking into like 10 houses that's a hundred damage eh, I don't know I, I don't think that's worth it and then um, yeah maybe this because you have so many war huts you have like insane military production and then also for the forbidden jitsu you want either rum distillery or there's another one that improves your like farm for field yeah this one uh, the other thing that I haven't really messed with is doing livestock livestock laming with the forbidden jitsu as well because like you could you could argue for sending 20 sheep in age 3 because you get the free farms uh, and you're camping anyway so you could that would probably pay off but like I said cancer spam is not my um, forte and so I'll leave it to someone else to perfect the forbidden jitsu but I've 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 released this this dark knowledge onto the internet now there's nothing I can do um, but for the sheep gang family I'll do uh, you guys we're, we're family so there are no secrets between us I will not uh, withhold the the profane wisdom of the forbidden jitsu it's not even that good it's nowhere near as cancerous as spain mexico italy like they they get the forbidden jitsu for free you have to spend 25 villagers to even like try to attempt to cancer but yeah so these are these are the decks i don't really have anything else to say about it um yeah, so then we'll just talk about, well, no, you know what, we're going to make this into a two-episode thing. The next episode will be about openings, um, which will be fairly brief, and then matchups, which will also be pretty brief. So this episode, I think, was the main part of the tutorial, and the next one will be much shorter, but... I think we'll still have some key information, but it's just broad, not like um, in-game knowledge uh, that we'll go over. And I'm not entirely sure how I'll approach it, but I think we're coming up, up at about an hour right now. So I'm going to end this one here. I hope this helps you guys play the Iroquois. If you have questions or opinions or criticisms, please let me know. And, uh, again, I'm going to start switching up the, the sieves here. I think I'm going to be doing some France, a sort of rotation of France, still some Iroquois. Sweden is going to be the one that I don't know that much about, but I'm going to start playing it. And then maybe, maybe some Spain. I basically just want one sieve that I know nothing about, a.k.a. Sweden. And, um one sieve that I know a lot about aka Iroquois and one sieve that I know a decent amount France um, and so on sort of a rotation because if I don't want to lose all my elo trying out some new sieve um, but yeah look forward to some num some uh, more variety uh, but yeah thank you for watching and I'll see you guys in the in part two where I talk about openings and matchups Anyway, uh, thank you, and subscribe if you like this, and tell me what you think in the comments. Adios.